Okay, to get started on the high poly version first, I've already got my scene set up with our background images placed. I've got one top view and one kind of side view to get us an idea of what exactly we're going to be doing. A couple things to note initially, uh, while working on low poly assets, since generally you're going to be doing these in a production environment and uh, adhering to production deadlines, unfortunately, one of the things that you really want to take into account is know what you need to create and what you don't. Number one, when we look at this, we can think of how it's going to be viewed in-game. And in-game, it's really going to be from primarily a top-down view. In fact, even if we, if we switch over to Unity real quick, I can show you the, the existing one as it stands now. And this was the previous one that I put together as the test. And you can see that really, you know, this is a pretty common angle as far as in-game play for third-person or first-person games uh, as far as how you're going to see the models. So you're never really going to see it lower than about this. And this is actually using a, a, a player that is probably a little shorter than usual. You know, fire hydrants are not very large objects, all things considered. You know, they probably come just over the knees of most people, or at least uh, this kind of standard American version does. And so there's some things that we can exclude from the modeling process to save us some time. Number one, we don't need to do any of these underside bolts. You're never going to see them in-game. It's extra details. That's just going to take extra memory, and it's not necessary. Uh, number two is uh, we're not going to be modeling the chains here. While the chains add very cool extra detail that's really awesome, it's also a little bit unnecessary. You know, when we look at the, the model here and we see that there's no chains, if you were to be running by this in-game, you know, if we just even go in-game here and just imagine that you're running by like this, you're never going to think about the fact, oh, that fire hydrant doesn't have chains on it. So that's another detail that's unnecessary. You know, unless you have the... Um, the liberty to really add in a lot of detail and you know you're really basically doing a tech demo or insanely detailed game and you have the hardware to do that um, then you know please by all means feel free but I'm trying to approach this tutorial as a practical example of one that could fit many different things uh, and the final poly count that we're going to be shooting for on the low poly version is going to be about 700 polys or so where it could be less, it could be more, but it's kind of right in the middle of sorts. So we're not going to be doing the chains. We're not going to be doing this little hook underneath that, sh you know, is where the hook chains hook. We're not going to be doing the underside of the base right here. Um, we will be doing the top sides of the bolts because these are going to be baked into our normal maps. But so those are some of the things that we can kind of think about while we're modeling this. So to get, get started on the actual model, let's start by adding in a circle. But before we add in that circle, we need to think about well, what does that circle need to do? And in this case, one of the things that we want to model into the high poly are these kind of insets right here. And I'm drawing with a mouse here, thus it's super, super messy. Um, but we've got those insets and we've got the ones along the top, whatnot. So we've got those insets that we need to create in our mesh. And in order to get a nice clean shape, I would like to have, you know, one poly along each on each side. So like this. So that gives us one vertex or two vertices per inset and based on this photo it looks like there's eight insets around the mesh and so we're just going to assume that's the case and we have eight total insets so that gives us a total of 16 vertices for a circle but in order to get this nice rounded shape here you know like this i would also like to have one more vertex in this center just to make sure that this doesn't appear too flat and so let's add another eight vertices for one in between each inset for a total of 24. So I'm going to hit Shift A, add mesh and circle, and let's immediately just hit F6 to bring up our operator panel, and we'll just change this down to 24 vertices. Okay, I can now hit Tab to go into edit mode, hit 1 to go back to front view, and let's just scale this down to about the right size, which is going to be something like that. I'm going for this distance here, and that's probably going to be pretty good. I'm going to go and turn off the manipulators just so you can see what I'm doing a little bit better, and then let's just extrude this straight up to about here so this is basically from the base to the top and then let's add in a loop cut by hitting Control r we'll slide this down and this is going to be for the start of the base here and then we'll add another one for the top of the base so we'll hit Control r add another loop down to about there which gives us that approximate thickness i can then go ahead and grab one more edge loop like this you know i'm going to move my 
uh, background image in just a little bit like this so that we can see it a little better without having to zoom out. And with the selected, I'm going to go ahead and just hit um, E to extrude, right click, and then hit S to scale it. And so that it doesn't scale up as well and get that weird angle, I'm going to hit Shift Z to exclude the Z axis and then just scale that right out. So that gives me that kind of plinth along the bottom. Then what I want to do is I'm going to add in another loop like this, just scroll way down. And this is going to give me the base along here. Now you notice that this has almost kind of like a weld seam through here. So let's go down, let's select this inside loop here. And I'm just going to scale it up. That will give us that kind of seam right through there. And by the way, I am using a development build of Blender, uh, built er just a few minutes ago, actually. So there will be some things that you'll see that I'll do that are a little bit different, such as when I use the grease pencil eraser. You can see I have a larger eraser now. Um, my screencast key status add-on is also slightly different. Uh, Pablo Vasquez, or uh, Venom GFX, as he's known, uh, updated this graciously for, for all of us, so it looks a little bit different, has a few more features. Uh, but nothing as far as the actual modeling tools that I'm going to be using has drastically changed. And anytime that something has, I'll be sure to warn you. But let's now add in one more loop, and this time it's going to be for the top portion here. And this time, that should give us what we want to do. So now I'm going to hit Control tab go into face mode, and let's see if I did my math right, which I may not have. But we'll do this, and I'm just going to select every other one. You know, I'm pretty sure I didn't do my math right. Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, I don't have nearly enough vertices for the way that I originally intended to do this, but that will work just fine, where you can see I've got um, eight sections. The thing that I don't have is each vertex in between because I didn't account for the vertex going through the center. So I actually should have used 32 vertices, but that's okay. No real harm done. So with these selected then, I'm going to go ahead and use my inset tool, which uh, in 2.63, you can find by hitting Control F and choosing Inset Faces. Now, in the development build, this now has a modal operator such that I can just move my mouse to scale it in. But assuming that you're not using a development build, then you can just hit F6 or go to your toolbar and find the operator panel down here to then adjust that inset. So hitting F6, let's then just, we're going to take it down. We're going to go in about half the width. So, you know, half in here. And then let's also change the depth down to go, say, something like that, probably. And I think that will work just fine. Let's then also disable Select Outer. And then I'm going to pull this down along the Z-axis. Maybe I'll scale it down a little bit more along the Z-axis. And I think that will... Oh, no. Okay, so we can see that we have something funky going on here. And this is because our normals are off. Um, generally, when you add a circle in Blender, let's just set this to Shade Smooth and you'll be able to see this immediately. If you set ex add a circle and then extrude that, the normals are not going to be accurate all the way around. So we just need to hit Control N, that will recalculate that, and then let's go back through and select this. And we'll find all these selections. Just like that. I'm going to hit I. This time I'm just going to go down with my mouse, just like that. Okay, and then we're going to pull this down along the z-axis a little. We're also going to scale down a little further along the z-axis such that we get a little bit more of a smooth transition here at the top, and then it's a little sharper at the bottom. All right, I'm going to hit Control tab go into Edge Mode, and then I'm just going to select the center edge of each one of these, and I'm going to then scale these in a little bit further. You'll notice that these are actually uh, con uh, convex right now, so they're coming out, and I want them to be concave. So I'm then going to select these, and now I'm going to hit S and Shift Z to again exclude the Z axis, and then just pull them in ever so slightly. And maybe we'll even scale these down along the Z, or up along the Z axis just a little bit more to round them out again. All right. Now you can see that that's kind of worked, but it's not super detailed. So let's do one more thing. Let's select all of these faces now that we just deselected. Actually, you know what? Uh, yeah. In vertex mode, you can just select all the vertices like this. And then we're going to hit um, one more option for the inset tool. Basically, I need to add another seam right around here. This is actually a good time to go and add in our subdivision surface modifier, 
which will demonstrate exactly what's going on here, where this looks like crap. And I want to make these really nice and sharp. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now hit Control F, Inset Faces, and then I'm going to immediately just left click. I don't care about the settings because I want to just hit F6 to then choose this. And I'm going to choose um, Outset rather than Inset. And then on the thickness, we're just going to bring this up and go something. Oh, you know what? That's actually not going to work very well. Okay, we're going to have to undo a couple of steps. We're going to step back just a little bit. It's okay. And then we're just going to quickly lose the settings and then choose inset rather than outset. Bring in just the tiniest bit. And then we're going to do it again like that. Then we'll scale it down along the Z axis, bring it down. And that starts to work. Okay. Let's now improve this by we'll add an edge, edge loop down along the bottom. Another one up along the top. Immediately that starts to help. And then let's add one more right down uh, there. So we can just bring those right together. Then what we can actually do is if we go in and select all but the center vertices. Just like this. Gives us all those. Then we can just pull these down and that will give us a nice rounded form. Uh, and maybe on these we'll pull these this down just a little bit more. Okay. That'll work. Uh, we might go ahead and strengthen this up just a little more by just adding in another edge loop on each one of these. A uh, little tedious, but you know there's only there's only eight insets, so it's not a big deal. Now there is another way that we could have done that, but I'm not going to worry about that. I'll sh maybe show you that on the next part of this. All right, that looks pretty good. But let's improve this a little further even, where I'm going to select all my vertices here, all my vertices here, and then all my vertices here. You'll notice I'm doing it in vertex mode and in wireframe mode, so I can just select all these. Because then I'm going to hit Control Plus to grow my selection, and then I'm just going to hit W and Smooth. And I'm just going to smooth those down a couple times. That'll get me a much nicer result there. Okay. One other thing that you want to keep in mind when doing low poly meshes like this is to uh, exaggerate the details a little bit. Since we're going to be baking all of these out to our normal map, and then that normal map is going to be applied to basically a, a just a smooth model that doesn't have any of these insets in, we want to exaggerate that detail a little bit because otherwise it's going to appear much weaker than the actual one when we normal map it. And so by exaggerating it, we can give it a slightly better result. All right, let's go ahead and sharpen up this area. So I'm going to add in two edge loops here. Then I'm going to scale them up along the Z-axis. And then I'm just going to hit E to extrude, right-click, S, and Shift-Z to bring them out. And actually, you know, we're just going to bring them out just a little bit. And then we're going to repeat that process. That gives us that nice kind of sharp uh, outset. I'll add another edge loop in here and another edge loop in here. And by the way, in this entire high poly version, we're not going to be using any creasing. Uh, basically, there's no need to because the the geometry or the perimeter edge loops and such are going to give us a better result uh, and are much quicker to do and much easier to modify. And since this is the high poly and we're going to be baking out to low poly, we really don't care how high poly this is. This can be really as high as we want it to be. Um, the only thing that really matters is then how high poly the the low poly one is for the final result. So I just modify those just a little bit. I'm also going to add in another edge loop here just to bring that out or sharpen that up a little bit. And I'm also going to add in two edge loops here and hit Alt S just to bring them out a little bit, just to help show that, you know, that's more of a weld line than anything else. And maybe we could even bring another edge loop all the way up to that and then bring it down. And then maybe bring these two down just a little bit, just to make sure that there's a nice clean line between those. We can maybe even select these, hit W and smooth. You know, kind of just tweak it to your heart's desire of sorts. All right, so that gives us a good start there. Let's now grab this section. And one thing that you may notice in this is that it looks like this bottom section is actually a little larger than this section here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select or I'm going to select this edge loop here, and I'm going to hide it. Then I'm going to select this bottom edge loop, and then just hit Control Plus a bunch of times, grow my selection 
Well, actually, that didn't really work very well. That's okay. I'm just going to deselect that. And then I'm going to just hit S, Shift Z, scale it up a bit. Then let's just add in another edge loop here, bring it up there, and then scale this all the way down to about there. And then I can maybe just add in another edge loop and go right down to there, scale it out. Another edge loop right there at the top. Then another, you know, just basically creating this kind of bevel of sorts. Okay. Now one thing you'll notice that I did there, whenever I added in the loop cut, you'll notice that it's not straight. So if I left click, add in the loop cut, and then slide it all the way up, I can then go ahead and left click and then pull it down. Now, there's a new option that's been added in 264. I don't believe it was in 263, but um, it does the same effect where if I hit Control R, add a loop cut, you'll see that now at the bottom of the screen, there's a couple options for even and flipped. If I hit E, it will then basically allow me to slide this evenly away from the edges. Now, right now, you'll notice that it's not, so I can, well, actually, no, it is. If I slide all the way down, it's going to then grab those vertices, go all the way to the edge. But up until I hit those vertices, it's going to stay perfectly flat. So this is a nice new feature that's been, I believe it was added in 264, uh, which, by the way, 264 should be out uh, from the time of this recording within a month or so, I believe, is the last word from the devs. But you can see if this was in 263 or not. If it's not in 263, then simply use edge slide, slide it all the way up, and then pull it back down. All right, so that gives us that. Uh, now let's, we're going to ignore all of this for the time being. Um, we're gonna, that's gonna be the last thing that we do because that's the most difficult part to get all these merged together. So for the time being, let's go ahead and just do this section here. And this section we can actually do, um, whenever I originally did this, uh, on this original one that you can see already in game, um, I modeled these separately, but let's go ahead and try doing this. Let's just duplicate this here. We're gonna hit Shift D, duplicate it, pull it up. It's right about the right height. And then let's just, let's position the 3D cursor right about here. So I'm gonna select these two vertices. You notice it's on both sides. I'm gonna hit Shift S, cursor to selected. That way it'll pull it right in. Then I can select this edge loop. And if I hit proportional editing tool by hitting O or turning it on down here, and let's just then scale this down. And you can see that's gonna work pretty well actually, but let's change the proportional fall off to sphere. And now there's no guarantee this is gonna work. I'm just trying this. If, but if we scale towards the 3D cursor using this option here, it's gonna scale it down like that. Uh, maybe I need to do a sharp fall off. Yeah, you can see that's actually gonna work kinda well, but let's maybe move the 3D cursor up, say to about there. And then maybe we'll switch to a smooth fall off to do a little bit further, say something like that. Then we can maybe slide this down a little bit and scale towards this individual center, scale it up just a little bit, and maybe exclude the z-axis. Bring it down. And there we go. That actually worked really well. And you'll notice that even on this, you know, it tends, it looks like from the photo that it's a little deeper at the base and then it gets shallower as it goes up to the top. And so that's actually exactly what we've gotten by doing what we just did. So that just saved a, a, a good bit of modeling time. And I think we'll just make sure we save our file. Let's turn off proportional editing. And I'm going to select this edge loop. I'm going to hit E to extrude, scale it out to about the correct width. It ought to be the same height as the bottom. So let's just go into top view. We'll scale this down. And then we're going to extrude this. We can go ahead and hit control shift tab, switch into vertex snapping mode. And let's just turn off proportional editing and then just snap down to one of these vertices. And then let's select both edge loops here and hit control E and use bridge to edge loops. This is available in 2.63. It's an excellent tool that was added for BMesh and just allows us to bridge two edge loops right together of equal number of faces. Now they have must or equal number of edges. They must have the exact same number of edges and generally need to be pretty well aligned in order to work well. But then I can just add in these edge loops, sharpen it up, 
Now I'm just going to scale that out just to make it a little bit more rounded, but really it doesn't actually matter because, again, we're not going to see the bottom here. And let's add in these two edge loops here in the center for this ridge. And we'll scale it up. And I'm going to go and inset it like this. And keep in mind that since I'm using 264, which, by the way, I do encourage you guys to use uh, development builds to at least try them a lot. You can get them from builder.blender.org. Uh, very easy to download. Very, generally, pretty darn reliable. Um, you know, use them as with anything. Use it with caution. Uh, don't don't trust your production work to it. You know, generally always keep a backup. But of course, that's you know general rule of thumb. No matter what you're doing. Um, but nice thing about Blender Blender is its development speed. And if you take advantage of the beta builds then you can really be trying out some of these new features as they come available. And not to mention, it also e then eases the release period on transitioning to the latest version. It makes it a lot quicker to get up to speed, you know, in little to no time at all. So just a subtle encouragement, um, you know, absolutely not necessary. Everything that I'm doing right here can most certainly be done in the uh, current 263. Uh, but you will find some things like the inset tool and the bevel tool are both easier to use in the 264 beta. I'm going to add in a loop here. I'm just going to pull that down a little just to add a little bit more definition between those two. And if you actually look behind the chain here, it actually looks like there's two rings here. So let's add in another ring here. Just add two edge loops. Then I'll hit Alt S, scale that up. Add another loop down to sharpen that up. There we go. Just again, helps add extra little detail. And I think, I don't feel like this is wide enough. So I'm going to just grow my selection from that one loop. Ah, I'm, I had a hidden piece. Just going to grow that like so. I'm going to deselect that, or actually we'll grab that and deselect that. Then I'm just going to scale these up. Just felt like that needed to be a little thicker for a good sturdy base. And we'll bring these up a little bit. I can maybe select these and I'll bring them down. There we go. Okay, that works. And now let's jump in and we're going to model the top. And then we're going to call that quits for this portion of the video. And then we'll jump back in to do the next part. So on the top here. We're just going to select these. I'm going to, we want to get this kind of profile like that, or it's, so you can see it, it's like that, basically. So we're going to extrude this in, scale in, extrude up, and then extrude out real quick, immediately followed by another quick extrusion to get a nice sharp line like that, and then extrude up. And notice that these are not perfectly flat. So I'm just going to scale them each to zero along the z-axis real quick. Um, they would have become unflat whenever we uh, use the proportional editing tool. There we go. That gives me that profile. Then I'm just going to extrude this up. And I'm going to duplicate my edge loop. Bring it down a little bit. Scale it out a little bit. And I'll extrude out. And I'm basically creating that top cap just by extruding, scaling, extruding, and scaling for something like, like that. So that gives us that top pretty quick and easily. Um, but we, can, we can see that since I duplicated it, they're no longer all shaded smooth. Uh, and what we can do now is go ahead and add in this top piece. And basically the way that I'm going to do this is I'm just going to... Uh, Hit E to extrude, scale this in just a little bit. Maybe we'll actually uh, delete one of those edge loops. We actually probably don't need all of them. Uh, and then we will actually, uh, let me think about this for just a moment. Uh, yeah, so we're going to hit Shift S, cursor to selected. Then we're going to hit Shift A, add in a plane. We're going to scale this plane down to about the size that we want, which is going to be, you know, something. Approximately like this, or this is, oh, you know what, this is actually not a square, that's actually a uh, a pentagon, it looks like. Yes, it is. 
So we can do this a little bit differently. Let's, you know what? We're going to make this a square. So you can see that most of these are pentagons. No, we will make a pentagon. Sorry. Okay, so we're going to delete this. We're going to hit Shift-A, add in a circle. We're going to change our circle count of vertices down to 5. And then we will scale this down, except that we want to scale it towards the cursor. Uh, pentagon won't otherwise scale directly towards the center of where you added it. And then we're just going to bring this down. Then I'm going to hit E to extrude, bring it up. And then we will bring it up again. We're going to hit E to extrude, right click, scale towards the individual center. And we're just going to scale that in. And then we're going to hit F to create an ingon. And let's then add in an edge loop to each side like this. Just to sharpen these up so that it maintains its uh, pentagon shape rather than the uh, kind of circular form that it had taken due to the subsurf modifier. Like that. Like that. There we go. And then what I'm going to do is uh, we're actually going to delete this ingon, actually. And the reason being is I can now select each of these vertices, hit E to extrude, and scale towards the 3D cursor. While excluding the Z-axis just to make sure that it uh, comes to itself. And you know what? We can actually do this in edge mode. If we do this in edge mode, this will allow us to do all five points at the same time. Notice that I'm not selecting the inside edges, only the edges of the points. And hit E to extrude, S, Shift Z to exclude the Z axis. And then go. And I'm going to hit W, merge, and collapse. And what that'll do is collapse each of the edges to their own points. Because now I can just select, say, this edge here, this edge here, fill up edge, fill these, fill those, fill those, and fill those. Same thing here. Then I'll select the inside, hit E to extrude, right click. W and merge at center. That gives us that. We could actually go ahead and select each one of these corners if we wanted and convert them to quads. Select everything, W and shade smooth. Control N to fix those normals. And then in order to get a nice smooth transition here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this edge loop. I'm going to scale it up. Then I'm going to extrude, scale in. Pull up a little bit, extrude, scale in, pull up, and basically just adding, you know, a small weld line there. Now I made that a little too extreme, so we can just scale this down along the z-axis a little bit. There we go. There we are. So it's, you know, fairly simple, but it'll give us kind of the, the result that we want and kind of help merge the surfaces between the two. Um, you know, it's not really going to matter all that much because on the low poly, you're barely going to be able to tell. Um, you know, it's definitely not going to even have a weld line on the low poly, but that will just add a little extra detail for the normal map. Now, I might have, again, made that a little too strong, so we'll just bring that down just a bit there. Okay. We're now ready to finish the modeling on the high poly section of our fire hydrant. The first thing that we're going to be doing is creating the actual water spouts here and here for the two smaller ones on the sides and then the one large one. And the way that we're going to be doing this is actually by what's called punch them through, which basically means that we're going to just add in a circle right here, and then it's just going to intersect right through. And if we do this well, and we add in some basically supporting geometry around it, we can actually give a pretty good impression that this is essentially welded onto the surface. And once you go in and apply all the normal mapping to the low poly and things like that, you're not even really going to be able to tell, and it will look quite sufficient. The other, one of the other reasons that we're doing this is it's also going to make the baking process much easier in the case of any problems that we might have. Uh, and it will also allow us to bake out individual parts if we have any problems with intersecting geometry and things like that causing issues during the bake. So to get started, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to go and select this object, go into edit mode. I'm going to select this circle. And one thing you'll notice right now is that this actually has a slight angle on it. 
Uh, and I want to get rid of that. So I'm going to make sure that vertex snapping is enabled. And I'm going to hit S and then Shift Z to exclude snapping along the Z axis. And then just snap to one of these vertices. And that will immediately bring that right in to make it straight. Then I'm going to select this edge loop. And I want to just duplicate it by hitting Shift D. And then I'll bring it down along the Z axis a little bit. I'm going to go and rotate it 90 degrees around the X axis. And then I'm going to hit P and separate by selection. The reason that I'm separating it by selection is that I'm actually going to snap this to this surface to allow us to then just um, basically, excuse me, conform it to the actual surface behind it and thus get a better result. So selecting our new circle, I'm going to hit tab the on edit mode. And then I'm going to pull it out along the y-axis to just sit somewhere above the existing surface. Then I'm going to go and scale it down just a little bit. You can see that this circle is a little smaller in its overall uh, diameter than the diameter of the base, or at least it appears to be in this, and that we're going to go ahead and do that because it'll make the process a little bit easier. And then I'm going to go down here and switch over to face snapping rather than vertex snapping, which you can also do by hitting Control shift tab choosing face. And then we just want to make sure that this option down here, the ability to project individual elements on the surface of other objects, is enabled. This way, we can just simply hit G, Y, hold down Control for a second to activate snapping, and left click. It doesn't look like anything happened until you rotate around, at which point you can see it's been snapped directly to the surface. And this then is going to allow me to just extrude out along the Y axis, and then I can hit S, Y, and 0 to bring it down. I'll maybe scale this down just a little bit. And that's going to be the starting point of our actual spout. But what we want to do is we don't want to just have this just like that. I instead want to scale it up just a little bit, bring it a little bit closer, snap it back along the y-axis again. And I want to add basically a weld seam to this to help give us a little bit of this gradual transition that we see right in there to get a better result. So I'm going to first just hit E to extrude, bring this back out along the y-axis, and then I'm going to scale this up something like so. And then let's also go ahead and scale it back in along the x-axis so that we make sure it's not sticking uh, out the side. And we can maybe go ahead and bring this forward a little bit then. And then I'm going to add in another edge loop just about like that to smooth it out again. And why don't we go ahead and set the shading on this to smooth. And we could probably scale this up a little bit more along the z-axis. Maybe we'll add in one more loop right here, which we can hit Alt-S to scale out along the normals, and that immediately gives us this little bit of a weld line of sorts, such that even though we can see this distinct line here, which by the way will look a lot less sharp once we add in textures and such, it suddenly makes sense that there's a line there because we say, hey, this is a pipe that's basically welded onto another pipe, and it just works then. Now, this might be a little bit small now, so I'm going to scale it back up. And then let's just, you can see that how this basically works, and we can see it from the top view that basically the edge of this pipe is about even with uh, the top cap here. So let's just bring this out to maybe about right there. Should be fine. And then I can hit E to extrude, right click, scale down just to add an end to that. And then let's just sharpen it right back up like that. And again there I'm using the new even tool in the edge slide, which if you don't have that, simply I uh, hit Control e edge slide, slide it all the way up, and then bring it back just a little bit along the y-axis and scale. There we are. Now, I want to go ahead and make sure that this is nice and sharp. So I'm going to add another edge loop right here. And maybe I'll bring this one just a little bit closer like that. Okay, that gets it nice and sharp. Let's save that. And then let's just select these three outer loops, this one. And we can just grow that selection twice. I'm going to hit Shift-D, move it out along the y-axis to duplicate it. And this is then going to be the cap here. So I could grab maybe this interior edge loop, extrude it out twice along the y-axis, and just have it intersect like that is fine. And then for the cap, we'll select this outer edge loop right here. And we're just going to basically extrude it in or out a couple of times. So first we'll extrude just a little bit to get a nice sharp edge. And then we'll extrude a bit more. And we can see about the, the depth of the cap here from the top is fairly deep. Let me even just slide this background image down a little bit so that you can see it. 
and we'll just set this to only the top view. And this one can be to, ah, we'll leave it where it's at. But we'll put this one. This is another option in 2.64 that's been added is the ability to uh, filter images to the back or the front, which is really helpful for kind of sorting images a little bit. Uh, works quite well. Uh, it's also used, it'll display on top of meshes or not. So you can see if I set this to front, it displays on top of the mesh. So just a nice handy little feature. Uh, again, that's been added in 2.64, uh, which will be again be out fairly soon. Or you can download beta builds to test a couple of these features uh, via builder.blender.org. So I'm going to extrude that. And then I'll extrude again, scale it, extrude again, scale it. And then let's just extrude and scale. And we'll leave it about like that. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll sharpen this up just a little. Say right in there. Okay, I think that gives us a pretty good result there. And let's then just grab... Uh, we can actually join these back together now. Uh, well, actually, no, we're not going to do that just yet. But I'm going to select this in a tab going edit mode. Let's select this top piece along with then our Pentagon piece. We're going to hit Shift D, right click, rotate negative 90 degrees around the X axis by hitting R, negative 90, and then hitting Enter. And then we're just going to move this down here. We can switch back to vertex snapping if we want, and then move a pro Placing this approximately along the center line of our other mesh, we can just hit G, Z, and snap. And by default, the snapping mode is set to closest. So it's just basically going to find the closest vertex of your active mesh to the one that you're designating as a snap point and use that for alignment. So in, that case, in this case, it's one of these vertices. And then I'm just going to move this in a little bit like this. And maybe then we will scale down the circle here so i'll so that i don't um, affect the depth i'm gonna hit s and shift y to exclude the y-axis just bring it in a little bit like this and for this we're not going to worry about the um since we're not doing the chain we're not going to worry about adding in a seam right here um this surface actually it's just going to be flat on the low poly you know basically it's going to be um like this without that uh, and we'll have the the bolt in there but that's about it uh, and so then the normal map is going to then catch you know this ridge here so we don't really need to add in that extra seam that's just going to add a little extra complexity to the normal map that we really don't need so this ought to be just fine now one thing i'm going to do is i'm going to rotate this uh, just a little bit just to basically add some variation to the mesh so that it's not just clear that, hey, that's exactly the same all over the place and is perfectly rotated because we don't want that. Okay, I think that works pretty well. Let's now add in these smaller sections, which basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to join or no, uh, I'm going to select this piece. I'm going to go into edit mode. I'm going to select all of it. And let's first set the 3D cursor to the scene origin by hitting shift C. And then we're going to set the 3D cursor as our pivot point such that when we duplicate this by hitting Shift D, then hitting R to rotate, Z to designate the Z axis, and then negative 90, we can just rotate right around the Z axis like that. And then we could go ahead and scale this down to approximately the correct size, maybe right about in there. It looks to be about two thirds the size of the large one. And that ought to work pretty well. But then we're gonna go and delete all of these. Let's just grow that selection. We're going to delete those. Let's select this piece. And we're going to hit P, separate by selection. We're then going to join it to the other one, like that. Because then on this piece, which by the way, I can go and add in a mirror modifier so that it goes across both sides here. I'm then going to do that same snapping process by hitting Control Shift Tab, switching into face snapping. And then from the back view, by hitting Control Number Pad 3, I'm going to hit E to extrude, Y to snap to the Z, or X to snap to the X axis, and then hit Control to snap directly to those surfaces. And it looks like parts of it did not work. Uh, let's take that back again, and let's try this one more time. There we go. So that time it worked. And then I can maybe scale this up just a little bit, uh, about like that. And then 
I can maybe bring this back just a bit. Hit E to extrude, bring it back along the x-axis in, scale it up. And maybe now that it's scaled, I'll go ahead and snap it again to the y-axis. And then hit E to extrude, scale it in, scale it out, and there we go. So that gives us a pretty nice gradual seam between those two, which we could probably improve a little bit more, maybe by adding another one here. Hit Alt S to scale out along the normals and add in that kind of weld seam of sorts. Now this one here, you can see that we need to bring it back in along the Y axis because it was poking through. This is maybe a little bit too strong. So let's hit Control E, edge slide just to bring that up. And I think that actually works pretty darn well. Let's save this file. And you know what, to uh, look at this a little further, Let's go ahead and add in, on this layer 1 here, we're going to hit Shift A, we're going to add in a lamp, and let's just choose, we'll just choose a sun lamp, because it's directional, and just hit Alt Z, and we're going to go into, uh, let's make sure that we're in uh, Blender Render Mode, and you can Alt Z will switch us into Textured Shaded Mode, which depending on the display type we're using, in this case we're using Multi-Texture, let's switch over to the GLSL material node type and that will give us a nice shaded view but you can see that right now we've got a lot of normals that are messed up here that's why we're seeing this black area so let's go into edit mode select everything hit control in that will recalculate those normals need to do it on this one as well control in recalculate those perfect and then we can just kind of rotate the lamp around kind of see how it behaves with the shading uh, we can go and add in a default material so let's just add in a basic material to this we'll add it to the other one as well and yeah, I think that's going to work pretty well. You know, you can kind of imagine that once the color is in there, you're really not even going to care about those seams because it's all just going to kind of blend together. So, all right, I think that works pretty well. Let's go and get rid of the lamp. We don't need it right now. We don't need to be in GLSL shaded mode. And let's now grab these pieces. Uh, actually, what we can do is let's uh, select the side pieces here. We're going to apply that mirror modifier. Now. Uh, you may have heard me before in previous tutorials say that in general, as a rule of thumb, you want to apply modifiers from the top down. Now, that only matters when the modifier above the one that you're applying directly affects what you're doing. In this case, the subsurf modifier doesn't actually have any effect on the mirror modifier since I don't have anything along the actual center line that's being merged together. And so it's not going to cause a problem. I can just apply it and we're good to go. You can see the warning up here. Uh, no worries. So now I can join these two together like that. And then I can go and select these two pieces. I'm going to make sure my cursor is still centered at the origin right down here. And then I'm going to duplicate these and rotate around the Z axis. So I'll hit Shift D, R, Z. Oops. Make sure the cursor is my 3D or my pivot point. So I'll hit R, Z, 90. And then let's just bring that in. I'll hit common to go back to individual centers. And looks to me like these are all the same size on all of these. Uh, you can see this from top view as well. Um, yeah, it looks to me like they're all the same size. So we're going to use just the identical ones. So that looks good. And then we can hit shift D again, period. Make sure we're rotating around the 3D cursor. And then RZ180 just flips over there. And we have all sides. So that's the majority of our hydrant done. The only thing left to add is the uh, the bolts along the top. And these are going to be really easy because we're going to take advantage of an add-on that's included with Blender. If we just go to the File menu, go to User Preferences, and then in the Add-ons section, just search for Bolt. And you can see Add Mesh Bolt Factory. Let's just enable this. This is an excellent add-on written by Aaron Keith. And if we then hit Shift A, add mesh, and choose bolt, we can rotate around here. You can kind of see what we have here. Uh, let me just actually delete that. I'm going to position my 3D cursor over here just so that then we can see it. And then if you hit F6, you can bring up all the different properties for that bolt. Now, in this case, we don't really care because we're going to use just exactly this. Um, we don't really care about the shank length. We don't care about the head height um, the the head type is exactly what we want 
So we're just going to hit Alt-G, reset the location of this, move it up along the Z-axis to about here. Uh, actually, no, let's actually leave it right where it's at. We're going to hit Tab to go in edit mode. We're going to scale it way down and then just position it right about over here. Say something like this. And just get the size that we want. That'll probably work good like so. That's a nice size. And then what we're going to do is we're going to hit Shift C, reset uh, the 3D cursor to the origin. We're going to hit Shift A, add in an empty. And we're going to use this empty then to control an array modifier. So on the bolt, we'll add in an array modifier. And this array modifier we're going to use to basically replicate this bolt around the center here. So if we disable the relative offset, we can enable object offset and point it directly at the empty. Because then if we just take this empty, say rotate it around the z-axis, it's going to then just move that bolt around. So what I, we can do is we can see that on the actual reference there appears to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, probably 8 bolts in here. So let's, um, you know, let's just rotate this around the z-axis. 360 degrees divided by 8 gives us 45 degrees. We can select our bolt. We can set this up to 8 like that. And there we go. We have our perfectly arrayed bolt all the way around. We can select this bolt, select the empty, hit Shift D. Actually, no, not Shift D. Instead, so that we can just replicate or modify one bolt if we ever need to change it, let's instead hit Alt D. And that will create a linked copy of the bolts that are then following the new duplicated empty here. You can see it's now set to empty 001, and the object data, or the mesh data, is then linked. You can see that there's two users that are then pointing to the original mesh data. So if you hit tab to go in edit mode on it, scale it up, left click, hit enter, it's going to apply to the other one as well. So this way we only ever have to modify one bolt, and they all update. Okay. I think that's going to give us our fire hydrant. We can go ahead and select our empties. Uh, we can just move them, or we can hide them. Let's select both the bolts. Or actually, let's just select everything. Let's hit M, and we're going to move it to layer 1. That'll be perfect, because on layer 1 is going to be our high-resolution uh, hydrant. Layer 2 will be our low-resolution, and then layer 3 will probably be all our other miscellaneous objects. Uh, let's just give this a once-over real quick, see if there's anything else we want to do. Um, one thing I'm a little concerned about is that this extra detail is going to get a little money in the low poly. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take these. I'm going to scale them up. Just scale along the z-axis. And then let's select these. Scale these along the z-axis. Just give that a little bit more size there. Um, that looks good. That looks good. I think we're probably okay there. Uh, just again, just giving everything kind of a once over, seeing what I think. Um, these feel a little sharp. Well, no, that's probably okay. One thing we could do though is we could probably go ahead and grab these edge loops in here, hit control plus to grow that selection. We just want these inside ones. And I'm going to go ahead and enable, uh, the X axis mirror by, if you go into the toolbar, scroll all the way down, you can see X mirror. It will then allow us to modify uh, vertices that are on one side and have it mirror across and affect the, the same vertices that are on the exact opposite position on the other side. And so we can just hit, um, from the front view, I'm just going to hit S, Shift Z, or no, S, Shift X, and just scale these up like so. The reason that I'm doing that is that way the normals aren't going to get, you know, have to go quite as far and should give us a slightly nicer result. Let's also go ahead and add another edge loop here and another edge loop here, which is just going to help sharpen up this point right in here. Make sure there's no weird shading bugs. I think that'll probably look look just fine. Just fine. Uh, yeah, okay. I think that we are probably good to go. Um, although I would like to maybe bring these up just a little bit. I'm just going to pull that up there, maybe pull this down, scale it in a little bit, just to make give that a little bit more room. Let's maybe select the, these two pieces as well. We'll bring them down just a little bit more. Keep in mind that this is going to be just a single edge coming up like that. 
And so we don't want to have too much detail in there that's going to get mixed. And I think that will probably do it. I think that looks pretty good. Although it feels a little tall to me. I'm just going to select all of this. I'm going to bring it down. Let's hit Alt H. Uh, bring it down along the Z axis. Just make it a little shorter. Maybe something like that. Maybe we'll deselect these pieces. Bring it down a little bit. I just feel like that just feels better. Um, I like the look a little bit more. Let's then select these bolts. We need to be sure that we select the empty as well. If you don't select the empty, it's going to do all kinds of crazy things like that. So what you can even do, if you hit Alt-H, make sure that your empty is visible. Uh, just select the bolts, then select the empty. Hit Control-P, apply the parent, and we'll do the same thing down here. Control-P, and this way I can move just the empty, and it will move the bolts. So selecting the empty, I'll pull it down, and there we go. Pull it down maybe just a little bit more. I'll save that file. And then one other thing that we're going to do on the bolts, actually, is when you're doing normal maps on low-poly objects, one thing that you want to try and avoid is straight 90-degree corners. The reason being is that if you have a rounded surface like this in your high-poly, and then your low-poly is this sharp corner, it's going to have an awfully hard time translating that sharp corner over the 90-degree point. Uh, or the rounded corner over the 90 degrees. So what you can do oftentimes, if, particularly if you're trying to imply depth, is instead uh, scale them out a little bit. So in the case of the bolts here, these bolts are not actually going to exist. If we look in our Unity project here, we can actually go in and look at the bolts. You can see that they're completely flat. They do not exist uh, in profile. But from the top view and the sides, they actually look pretty good. They look as if they're there. And one of the ways that we do that is by basically, rather than having a straight edge here, and then, you know, a straight 90 degree turn here that then you're trying to visualize from the top. Instead, we're going to skew this angle a little bit. So it's not actually going to be realistic, but it will give us a better effect on our actual bolt. So one thing we don't, we don't actually need all of this extra stuff in here for the threads. So let's just delete that. Uh, and then we can just select this in our sides. Let's just scale it up like this. So maybe select the top portions here. We'll scale them in bit. Whoops, went too far. There we go. And so then from the top, it, it actually looks as if there's a bolt there. Now, when we look at it like this, it's very, or from the orthographic, it's very clear that something is wrong with those bolts. But as soon as you hit five and go into perspective mode, you don't really notice that. And instead, it just kind of looks like there's supposed to be a bolt there. Uh, and really what this allows us to do is just get better fake the, the impression that there's a bolt uh, on that surface when in reality there's not and it's all just being achieved by the normal map So that would give us a slightly better effect uh, I think that's about it. Okay, so we're gonna save the high poly just like this. Let's go ahead and select it here I'm going to name this as hydrant underscore high and We can just leave the empties just like they are the world Let's actually select the camera and the empties and we're just gonna hit M and move them all to layer 3 because then on layer 3, we'll keep our lights, layer 2 is going to be our low poly, and layer 1 will be our high poly.